So this, this, um, this panel is really about goals and working with other stakeholders um, up and down your value chain. And you know, companies that have set these really ambitious goals, they have a lot of tools at their disposal, right? But any company that's been down this path knows that they can't do it by themselves. They have to, to stay on the right track. They have to work with those who are, um, who they, they prioritize their engagement and who actually value what they do the most. Let's put it that way. Your stakeholders have the biggest, I would say, interest in your success. So whether that's your suppliers, whether that's your distributors, whether that's your employees. They have a, they have a, I guess, a, an interest in making sure that you succeed. So, engaging with the value chain, engaging with your investors, suppliers, employees, that's important. And I know all of you do that. And we're going to talk about that in this session. We have three really excellent speakers. We have Suzanne Fellander, VP of Global ESG with Prologis, there in the middle. Um, Monique Alexander, Chief Sustainability Officer, Keurig, Dr. Pepper. And Monique, Monique, Beth, I have the worst trouble with your name. Now I'm calling you something different. <laughs> okay. Beth Watayas. She's the Senior VP, Net Zero Strategy Executive for the Bank of America. And, and so to get us started, rather than me telling you all about their extensive backgrounds, I thought it would be good to start out by, why don't you tell us a little bit about your context, what you do for your companies, and how you're connected to this topic of stakeholders and your value chain, if you wouldn't mind. Monique, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, so thanks for the introduction and the opportunity to join you guys today. Uh, Keurig Dr. Pepper, KDP, that's the, the company at which um, I work. And when I joined the company in 2012, we were Green Mountain Coffee Roasters, so we do coffee. And we became Keurig Green Mountain so we also do appliances and, and coffee makers. And then in 2018, we merged with Dr. Pepper Snapple Group. So we also do uh, cold beverages ranging from soft drinks to waters to juices and actually a little bit of applesauce we'll talk about too. So um, a very diversified, uh, what we call modern beverage company working across all the different um, offerings. And a lot of people don't know that we merged. So just a few stats about the company and, and kind of our footprint and where we operate. We do about 15 billion in net sales. Now 90% of that is in the US, the other 10% between Canada and Mexico. We have 30 manufacturing facilities, 25 of those in the US. You're getting the theme here. I'm trying to set the context that we are primarily a US-based company. Um, we do have over 150 warehouse and distribution sites, and uh, we have one of the largest fleets in the U.S., primarily heavy-duty trucks. So pretty big distribution network, which is actually one of our competitive advantages. And why we see that as a competitive advantage, we own that distribution, uh, it plays into our brands. So 125 brands between owned licensed, and what we call partner brands. So this gets into the stakeholder side of things and why we collaborate so much. So on any one of our trucks, you could see some of the brands that we just do distribution for, like Evian or Vita Coco. Uh, you would also see uh, in our portfolios Starbucks, um, Coffee Pods, Duncan, Intelligentsia, Pete. So we have a lot of really complicated relationships. And so when it comes to our sustainability objectives and targets, they're very intertwined, right? Because of transportation impacts, sourcing impacts, et cetera. So to say that we can't do it alone is an understatement. Absolutely have to work with our stakeholders. Suzanne? Yeah, no, thanks. So hi, everyone. I'm Suzanne Fallender, and I head up uh, Global ESG at Prologis. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Prologis, we'll do the same level setting on our, our business. Um, we are the global leader in logistics real estate. And what that means is we build distribution centers, but we lease them out to uh, about 6,600 customers in 19 countries around the world. We have 1.2 billion square feet around the world, so a really big global uh, presence. And I think what we are 
looking at it with that scale and that size, that's really, uh, we have a huge responsibility for how we build, design, and lease and manage those uh, facilities, but also there's a huge opportunity in the value chain to work with our customers. So when we think about those customers that are 6,600 customers, that might be some of the largest global brands, but it also is a lot of companies that are maybe smaller and really trying to figure out their decarbonization strategies and thinking about how do they approach when they choose space, but increasingly, how do they handle the electrification of their fleets? And so we're sitting in this space where we're you know, a real estate company, but we're also building out services through our Prologis Essentials business to provide support for our customers in operations, energy and sustainability, mobility, and also workforce. Um, and so we have been setting different goals in this space, and I can talk a little bit more about our net zero goal, but also looking at the community aspect of it as well, and programs we're developing to help our customers and local governments around economic development and the logistics needs as well. Well, thanks, Susanna. And Beth, you want to just take a stab at, um, I mean, your engagement in this topic, and I know you work a lot with stakeholders. Yes, absolutely. Um, well, thank you, Janet, and to my panelists, it's great to be here. Um, so I'm with Bank of America. I'm guessing most of you know who we are. Um, we're one of the largest commercial banks in the world. And I have been doing environmental work for 17 years now, and the vast majority of that has been at the bank. So when we think about the bank's evolution and our climate journey, it's very much kind of followed my career as well. Starting from, I think, the first time I met Janet, we were building an employee engagement program at the bank to our 100% renewable goal and the strategies that we built to get there, carbon neutrality and operations. And then now for us, in 2021, we committed to net zero before 2050. And that for us covers operations, supply chain, and our financing activities. Um, and so for those of you who are GHG accounting buffs, that is category 15 of scope three. And for financial institutions, that is by far and wide the largest category of emissions for us. And it's, the, it's relatively nascent for financial institutions until the end of 2020. There had not been a universal accounting standard for financial institutions to calculate those emissions associated with essentially our loans and our investments. Um, and so that's the work that myself and my team are driving forward now in particular is getting our arms around those emissions associated with those loans, um, starting with our commercial credit portfolio and beginning to set um, 2030 science aligned targets for key high emitting sectors. Um, so as we begin to calculate these emissions, we've set targets for our auto manufacturing sector, our energy, our power portfolios, and over the next year, we're going to roll out, I believe, five more targets for those key high emitting sectors. Um, so that's a big part of our focus. And just to give you some context, um, so those are our clients and our customers. And I'm just curious, how many of you in this room are in transportation, agriculture, work for a municipality, or in energy, power sectors? OK, so decent. OK. How many of you have home loans or car loans? OK. Um, so this is what we're focused on, and to like drive home, we cannot do this alone. Everyone you know, that we interact with, and we have millions of customers and clients, are part of how we get to net zero, because when we calculate those emissions, we're taking a portion of every one of those clients' emissions into our own scope three. So that's where we're spending a lot of time, and then building out the more comprehensive transition plan, of course, across all of those different areas. What other conference can you go to that people talk about emission scopes and have and, and, and pretty much ensure that everybody in the audience knows what they're talking about? <laughs> so let's get a little bit more granular. Let's talk about how do you engage your stakeholders? I know you do because it's important and it's a priority, but how do you do it? Monique? Uh, early, <laughs> early and frequent. Um, <laughs> You know, we, we're a fairly new company in the sense of being Keurig Dr. Pepper. We merged in 2018. Um, and it's a great moment. I mean, as hard as that is to try to take two different worlds and combine them under, under one roof, that integration effort was a great opportunity for us to take a really hard look at the targets and our stakeholders and to say, 
what has to be true to validate that we're still going to stay on this path versus what are our new trajectories. And I think one of the things that we've really embraced as a hallmark of how we engage and how we set targets is that we actually start implementation before we ever set the commitment. So there's the aspiration, and then there, there's the actual process. In fact, there was a comment this morning, our very first speaker was saying, you know, he was giving the guidance of don't celebrate the potential, celebrate the utilization. And I think our version of that is don't celebrate the aspiration, celebrate the progress, right? And so when we get started on any kind of uh, engagement, it's the landscape and context and really understanding that first. And that has to come from the internal engagement and, and stakeholders across the business, as well as the external on each of these individual areas, but obviously climate being one of them. And one of the things we found in doing that landscape more recently is this intersectionality. So I don't, it, it's certainly been a buzzword in our sector. I don't know if, if it has been across the different sectors that are represented in this room. But whereas, yes, we have climate goals, we also have a regenerative agriculture goal for 250,000 acres under regenerative agricultural practices or conservation by 2030. We have a net positive water aspiration. We have a virgin plastic reduction goal. All of these are contributing to our climate efforts. And so that would not have necessarily surfaced as, um, as easily or quickly if we hadn't been engaging so deeply across the different range of stakeholders. Excellent, and, and I'm glad you answered about how you get started. It's like how you get started, when you get started, and the, and the specifics, I think, matter, especially for those who are new to this. Suzanne, I mean, where and how do you start? Yeah, I, mean, I think I, I'll kind of maybe talk about it in the context of some of our public goals. And we've been setting public goals for many years, and it's certainly when you have those goals, you then have the plans around them. And, and we've had goals in, in multiple areas. But when we set our net zero goal last year, in terms of that collaboration, we were really looking, we have a goal to achieve net zero across our scopes one, two, and three, getting the scopes back in, um, by 2040, um, by getting to uh, net zero for scopes one and two by 2030. But then when we looked at that, and what were the levers that we were going to have to pull, and where were the biggest impacts um, in our footprint, um, the biggest part within our, well, scope three is 99.9% .9 of our greenhouse gas footprint. And the biggest portion of that is our category 13, <laughs> um, the, our downstream leased assets, but that's the energy use of our customers in our facilities. So the biggest way, that, or the biggest thing that we need to work on for our net zero goal is to help our customers decarbonize their operations in, and, and, and really get to renewable energy. So when we're thinking about that and having conversations with customers, but also within our broader business strategy of how do we line everything around working with customers, I think that how is really important to how do you anchor it in your core business. And so thinking about you know, how can we build and change our business so that we're not just trying to reduce and do less bad, but it's actually helping us to grow a way that we're serving our customers. Um, and so then we were looking, so, so we've actually set a um, goal to get to one gigawatt of solar. Right now we're over 400 megawatts. Uh, we're the number two in on-site insta installed solar here in the US. Um, but that goal is really helping us to drive that, that conversation. Um, the other thing I'd say in collaboration is some of the harder to decarbonize parts of our footprint, like the second biggest part um, of our footprint is uh, building materials. So think about concrete, think about steel, think about how all the different things you can put in a building. Um, and so we've been uh, partnering with others. We're not going to help decarbonize concrete by ourselves. We're going to work with concrete leading uh, companies, we're going to be working with researchers, we're going to be piloting and different technologies. And then we've also been working um, to leverage our investment arm. We've got a ventures arm that has been investing in and partnering with smaller companies that are doing that innovation where we can kind of get out ahead of some of that. So I think it's looking at each one of your parts of your goal and your strategy and then saying, who do I need to work with directly to get there? And then how do I um, you know, accelerate that in that. And then certainly the other thing I'll just say is the internal collaboration. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that has been talked about in a lot of the sessions here. But that's what I'm seeing is the, the biggest, most important part of the how 
is lining that up internally uh, and really making sure you're having the right people at the table, whether it's your construction teams, your design teams, and, and building that into the strategy. Uh, that's really important. And we, and we have three different sectors here. Right. We have you know, real estate. We have, you've got a lot of different pieces to your business. And then finance. So are you doing the same thing? Are you getting do, doing and, and putting the same pieces in place? Beth, how are you getting started and how are, how are you making this work? Sure, I think, I mean, there's a lot of intersectionality just between all of us. I think we're all in each other's problem. Yeah. Net zero's targets to some degree, but for us, I mean, I think what you've said is understanding the landscape is really, really important. And for us, that's quite complex. And in many ways, that started with really talking to our frontline units, so our bankers, um, our risk partners, getting kind of everyone engaged from the beginning and building some of that foundational knowledge across the enterprise. And so we've, you know, we've had an employee program um, now for 13 years, but we went beyond that and we have an internal online college. Um, where the bankers were really required to go through it. It's been optional for a lot of the other employees. Um, but we've rolled out things like Net Zero 101, Net Zero 201, <laughs> and we're continuing to expand. But I think what's particularly interesting for us is, you know, this is all evolving very rapidly. We are implementing and engaging, and, and it's just a constantly evolving and moving space. Um, I think you know, we've made a lot of voluntary commitments. Um, and when we do that, we look to do those with both our kind of clients and these key sectors, uh, as well as within our own industry. And so that's been really successful in getting some of those bankers and those clients engaged in these various efforts. Because for us, we not only have to understand what a financial institution needs to do to reach net zero, we actually have to understand what all of our clients have to do to reach net zero. So we have to become experts in oil and gas, in aviation, in cement, as you mentioned, in real estate, and what it takes for them to decarbonize. And so really putting our, ourselves behind different efforts that are driving forward best practices there has been really fundamental. Um, and we've helped found a variety of industry alliances and ones that cross sectors, et cetera, like the Sustainable Markets Initiative or the Net Zero Banking Alliance, different efforts within RMI and things like that have been really valuable. I think we're, we're hearing a consistent theme here that uh, suppliers and your, your value chain yes. are a critical piece. And Suzanne, I just want to come back. You said that 99.3% of your footprint 99.9. What's that? 99.9 percent is scope three. I wrote that down wrong. Yeah. 99.9. .9. That's yeah. huge. Yeah. Okay. So, so you have a pretty big footprint. You have a large real estate holding. How do you measure success? Is it just in um, one gigawatts, or are you like? I mean, how are you measuring success? Yeah, so we have, goal, beyond our net zero goal and the one gigawatt of solar goal, um, we have goals about 100% um, LED lighting. We're tracking to for 2025. We're looking to get 100% of any new construction is to lead or equivalent. We have different standards we use in Europe um, in some markets. Um, so we have these goals that we're working toward, but data is really at the core of this. And I'd say, um, as a company, would you imagine we've got 5,500 buildings in all those countries and different regulations and different things. Um, so we are a pretty data-centric company to begin with, but we've been going through this process of looking at how to make sure we're automating as much of that data as possible. We're you know, um, working very closely with our head of IT on re-looking at our systems. Um, if you think about ways you can um, meter buildings differently so that we can have that real-time information. Because I always think of data in terms of what's the quality you need, what's the efficiency and automation of that data, and then making sure it's actionable. And when I talked about how we're going to work with our customers and helping, how do you pri help people prioritize what to do first? So data is really about being able to visualize and see you know, where should you spend your time? Because we have to accelerate action on all these, these points. But you can't do everything all at once. Um, so I, I'd say the data piece is really critical. We see that as increasingly, it's probably what I spend most of my time on these days, <laughs> um, with finance and accounting and, and IT, um, and looking at our systems and looking at how to um, leverage that. Um, 
And, and the other piece, you know, going back to what you were talking about, is um, really the investor discussions that we're getting, especially um, we also have a whole strategic capital business in addition to the real estate part of the business. And so we're dealing with investors on a regular basis who are really trying to look at how they are prioritizing and looking at their real estate portfolios alongside of us in terms of being able to have the data they need to make decisions. When I think about real estate, I think about getting electricity. And, and we know that, that getting data from a utility can be a challenge because of data privacy issues. So it just makes me think about it. I mean, there, there are challenges when it comes to getting data. So why don't you tell us about those challenges? Because I can't imagine that ag doesn't have, I mean, that you don't have some challenges getting data from the agricultural sector. So could you guys talk about the challenges you have of getting that data that Suzanne has so, you know, has identified as so important? Yeah, I mean, I can s s just add a little bit. I mean, I think you have to look at things like getting your building, whole building data, right? And there are certain places where the structure of your lease makes it really hard to get that data. Um, there are some certain places where there are benchmarking ordinances, and here in California, where you're required to be able to get that information if you need it, if you meet certain requirements. So I always think about data as all the levers you can pull. And, you know, and so you never, it's never going to be one thing to get certain types of data. And then there's also uh, making sure that when you do need to estimate data, you have the highest quality of estimation. And so I think that's what we're seeing in this ESG data, um, you know, maturity process. Um, it was talked about in one of the last sessions on the SEC, is there's a lot of learning going on really rapidly um, in, in this area. But I, I think it's getting the best data you can and continuing to try to do that, but then at after that, it's about making sure you can really estimate so you can make the right decisions until you can get the full data. And having partnerships, I suspect. And having partnerships, yes. Yeah. And I think there's a step further upstream than, than just jumping right to data as the solution, because when you're measuring progress, uh, you could do that with a variety of different metrics, right? And when you're working with a diversified supply chain, a diversified product base, it's not always a one for one, right? It, depending on what commodity, for example, that you're talking about on the agricultural side. And I mean, d just from an anecdote point of view, when I think about progress and, and that word, it always triggers this for me. When my daughter was little, she had a great imagination and she would go to work. I, I has still have no idea what she was working on, what her job was, but it involved a clipboard. And she would <laughs> scribble on the clipboard, and you know, you would ask her, you know, how's it going, or you know, what are you doing? She would always answer the same thing with a whole lot of conviction. She would say, "I'm making progress on the progress." And I'm like, okay. So it's become a little bit of a family joke, but I also think about that in the work context of when we're trying, <laughs> what are we trying to achieve here? And so spending a lot of time up front on definitions, common definitions and common standardized measurement has been so important on our journey, especially as it relates to agriculture and regenerative agriculture. It's a bit of a wild west in that space, and if you're not starting out with the same definition and a common agreed upon set of metrics, then you are just making progress on the progress, right? You know, you're not really making an impact. That, that's so important. Beth, do you wanna jump in? I mean, I think I would just probably be adding to what you're saying. I mean, and maybe to give some context for us, just starting with emissions, um, I think it's been five years ago now, we made the decision to try to start using reported emissions information for our supply chain calculations. And at that time, we could get about 20% of our suppliers um, real reported information. So now you take that and we're trying to apply that to our clients as we're setting all these kind of sector targets, and we're literally having to, we're prioritizing reported information, so please report. <laughs> um, but we're manually having to go pull that from financial reporting or sustainability reports in order to collect that information. And since we're really focused on these key high emitting sectors and a lot of these global public companies, you're seeing around two thirds of that being reported for scope one and scope two and then scope three drops down drastically. And then when you add that layer of is it verified or not verified, that drops down quite a bit as well. 
And so that's the reality that we're dealing with. And a lot of us, though, and you said this as well, Monique, like we're setting targets and we're building strategies. And a lot of this is based on estimated data right now. You know, our commercial real estate portfolio is going to be pretty much 100% estimated emissions data because it's not readily available by building. Um, and so there is a lot of evolution and data that has to be calculated and disclosed and then put into forums where it's easily accessible by all the stakeholders and people that need it. And, and to your point, driving some kind of convergence with standards is extremely important. And we're seeing that you know, as we go in and try to understand the different sectors and what is the climate guidance? How are they calculating their own emissions, et cetera? And that's just one metric. And obviously, that's really important. And I'm sure everyone in this room is focusing on reducing emissions. But for us, that's just one metric that will begin to give us insight into how are our suppliers doing when they're working towards net zero? Are they working towards net zero? And our clients, of course, right? And there's just a variety of metrics and things that are not readily available to help inform and help us understand their own progress and then therefore our progress. Yeah, I think, I mean, as, as a company, a new, we do a lot of footprints. People call us and say, well, where do I start? And we say, well, you've got to measure your footprint. And like, well, we don't have any of that data. So you have to start somewhere, even if it's not perfect. Yep. And, and I want to come back to the point that, that uh, Beth made about getting the definitions right. And you started it. And I want to come back to ag. And USDA is doing a ton of stuff right now. So Climate Smart Ag, um, Growing Climate Solutions is, was in the budget bill. So how, do you, how important? Is it just about definitions? Or is there, is there more to it than just definitions with getting policy? How important do you mm -hmm. think policy is? Yeah, policy is a huge enabler. And I know that it's come up a number of times throughout the sessions. Um, and, it, and we're referencing what's been commonly referenced has been more around the IRA and some of the other larger um, broad sweeping uh, climate pieces. But on ag, there is a really interesting opportunity, I think, that um, yeah, I could bring it to life within an example. Economics and environmental impact go hand in hand, right? When we work on regenerative agriculture projects with our um, suppliers and farmers, be it in coffee, in apples, in corn, any metric associated with soil health, emissions reductions, water quality improvement, they have to be coupled with yield improvements, productivity improvements. These things have to go hand in hand. But a farmer has to be profitable before they can invest in regenerative agriculture or conservation, right? And so there have to be more incentives to de-risk that investment. Now, when we buy apples from about 100 apple growers in upstate New York that goes into Mott's applesauce, it's a very defined group of growers that we can work with directly on incentives within the context of the business. But when we're working with corn growers, which are about three or four times removed from us, and it's a very diverse group, um, still predominantly US sourced, but that's a different set of incentives that need to be put in place, right? It is cover cropping that we are investing in, in corn, in combination with other uh, companies. But what that cover cropping does from a soil benefit point of view is it uh, prevents erosion and it prevents crop loss. And so one of the things that we've been advocating from a policy point of view is for the Cover Act, which was introduced last year, and is a discount on insurance, crop insurance premiums. Right, so it's that incentive that can help to de-risk the investment in cover cropping that has a you know, huge range of benefits. Uh, another, just broadly speaking, having regenerative agriculture more specifically called out within the farm bill, at the point of reauthorization, so that would be a, a great move. And then even more specifically, again, we're very, very invested in coffee, uh, coffee appropriations for research and R&D. We helped to start an organization called World Coffee Research 12 years ago that looks into breeding climate-resistant plant varietals 
But to have those dollars available, for example, to USAID, which has been a longstanding partner of ours on resilience projects, the money for the research has to be available. So advocating for specific uh, allocations for coffee research and climate resilience is another area that we're quite invested in. I think it's, um, it's a mistake not to think about resilience and mitigation at the same time. Absolutely. Because we're kind of past the point where we can just say there's no impacts. We're already seeing those. We heard that from Nancy Sutley earlier. I mean, those impacts are occurring. So thinking about how you build it all and connect the dots between those things, I think those are important. Um, when, you, when you think about the, you talked about incentives for farmers. When you think about your supply chain, oftentimes they're smaller. I mean, farmers, that's very small, but, but not necessarily even a, um, it, you don't have to go quite to the farmer level. A lot of times, suppliers are just smaller companies, and they don't have the resources. They don't have the manpower, they, or woman power, sorry. Um, and they don't have goals. How do, you, how do you deal with these smaller, I mean, what do you, how do you deal with these smaller companies that don't have the bandwidth, that don't have the resources that you all do? I mean, I think it's, uh, you raised an important point is you also, not every supplier, it's not just about size, but it's the type of supplier. So every type of supplier or different commodity or different thing you're looking at is going to have different challenges or different sustainability or climate impacts. So I think it's about putting together that plan and right-sizing that and, and kind of taking a risk-based and impact-based approach to your engagement. Um, I spent more than a decade doing this work in the technology sector, and there was a lot around capability building um, with um, suppliers and also collaboration among companies through a group called the Responsible Business Alliance, um, and had a lot of experience even like helping um, to train them on how to do GRI reporting early on and making that easy and getting them started down that path. So I think um, it's, it's helping smaller companies just know where to get started. And I have been ha having these conversations with smaller customers too, like CEOs of a smaller customer saying, okay, I only have 200 people, but I'm hearing all this stuff about climate readiness and what's happening in the SEC and how do I even start? So I think it's the same conversation of where we sit in the value chain. If you look at your customers, you look at your suppliers, how do you share that expertise in a way that is helpful or, po or point them in that direction? Yeah, I mean, I can say I mean, similar programs that we rolled out years ago with our suppliers as well to try to educate them about how to calculate emissions and how to report to CDP and things of that nature. And so that has kind of started there. And then going back to what I said earlier, now it's really about the frontline units and those bankers that are having those conversations with those small business um, banking clients, those business banking clients, you know, all the way up to the, the corporate investment. And so for us, it starts with building that knowledge and capacity within you know, those folks that are out there meeting with these clients of every level, every day, um, and helping be there as they begin to have questions. Because you know, when I talk about our sectoral targets, when we think about like auto manufacturing, that really is focused on those auto manufacturers. So the top of the value chain is where our target is really focused. And the, the point of that is then it's going to trickle down, right? As those auto manufacturers are setting net zero targets, they're going to begin you know, requiring their suppliers to then have products that meet net zero standards, et cetera. So it's that kind of trickle down effect. And I think for us as a financial institution, we can support both those medium, small, and large clients by understanding their sector, understanding what it means to decarbonize and providing some of that expertise. I'm going to stick with you for just a sec, Beth. Mm -hmm. So you've done a lot of different things, a lot of different strategies. What's, what would you say, just pick one, pick one. What do you think has been the most effective strategy for engaging in your value chain or with suppliers? Just, just, just tell us about one. That's the one you did with us, right? No, just kidding. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, oh, gosh. I don't know. I'm probably not the right person to answer that question. I think right now um, we're in the mode of building an army internally that can go out and take that message to every client or supplier that we're interacting with 
And I think that's been the most um, effective. And that involves a variety of things like we've talked about. That involves some advocacy. That involves getting involved in various industry climate-related efforts. Um, and so I think it's, it's really that. And what I would say is that through our journey, and we didn't, you talked about progress, there's many different ways that we can see progress. But in particular, what I have seen is systems change. And I've seen that within my organization. We now have folks in every, we call them organizations within the broader firm, we have climate folks in every group. Um, and it is a focus for all the way up to the board, to the CEO, et cetera. And so you see that, and then you begin to see that trickling out with suppliers and clients. And over the years, I think we've all heard anecdotal things from suppliers mostly, and then of course now more and more clients. Um, and so I think it's the combination of those things, but it's really taking that message out and, and being prepared to answer their questions. I, I love the Army part. It's kind of like training the trainer. Yes, it is. It's expanding your voice. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've been talking about all the successes and how you've been doing and getting moving forward, but What's a good panel without a few, okay, what's the biggest problems out there and what are the biggest challenges? And tell me how you got around them because everybody has challenges. That is just part of working on climate change. Well, I'll, I'll offer my yeah. moment of truth as everyone's uh -huh. been referencing their, their net zero. We don't, we don't have a net zero target. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, we start implementation before we ever set our targets. And so really understanding that landscape, like I mentioned, understanding the baseline of where we are today and integrating with the business plan. You know, as we're, as we're headed through this path and we already had our science-based targets, which we set our science-based targets in 2019 was when we submitted. It's aligned to a well below two, which at the time was acceptable and the world has moved very quickly to the 1.5, right? So we are in a moment of reevaluation where we're looking at, okay, we need to move to 1.5. How are we going to do that? But the challenge therein is back to that fleet question that I, I scenario, I guess, that I painted for you a little bit earlier. We have a very large fleet, heavy, heavy truck, transporting beverages that operates in the US. And so we have policy mechanisms, right, in the state of California, the clean fleet rule just passed, but we also have a very heavy fleet uh, presence in Texas. And there was a panelist a little bit earlier saying, we we're in Texas, we don't like regulation, right? So there's not the same kind of evolution of infrastructure and technology along the same timelines for us to move as quickly as we want and need to. So this is one of our big challenges, is fleet decarbonization. And it is what is holding us back from being big and bold and signing up for net zero right now, which is also a moment when corporate commitments are under a whole lot of scrutiny. Mm -hmm. And whether they have a solid glide path and transition plan behind them, and how realistic is that transition plan and glide path. So the challenge for us is not just in, in terms of what can we do and when, but it's being really transparent and honest about that. And not stopping. We started the implementation. Let's just keep going, doing what we can and learning as quickly as possible, being very smart about our partnerships, picking people who can advance not just a dialogue, but action and transition. And so that's where we're investing our time and our efforts. We've taken delivery of eight electric uh, trucks in Canada because it's a smaller light duty fleet up there for us. We'll learn as quickly as we can from an actual what can we do, but then also joining the right tables, the right collaborations to advance the technology, the infrastructure, the policy, et cetera. Thanks, Thanks for that candor, because this is not easy. I don't know of any company it's easy for. I mean, if you have no emissions, you're probably not in business. Suzanne, have you, have you yeah. run into something that just seems like a roadblock and have you gotten around it? No, it's been super easy. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, no, but but no, I think marrying two things that you both said, I, I think that one of the challenges is a bit about um, how do you move fast enough on some of these things? And really the pain point you talked about with the fleet is what we're, we're building a business to help our customers and others, so we can talk about that. Um, but um, 
doing that in a way that um, we can go fast enough. And, and I think the, um, the collaboration required on that, because it's really looking at, at not just something we can do all by ourselves, but we have to work with utilities, we have to work with cities, we have to work with customers. And so I think really thinking about that infrastructure, it's a very complex business. And the business we're building in that space is very different than core real estate. So even with inside the company, thinking about how do we still manage and evolve our core business while we're building this other set of solutions around. And so I think it's been really kind of, it's a people part of kind of the change management and really in engaging all the parts of the organization to think differently. And then it's about, you know, how do you go faster? Uh, one of the things that, you know, as we, as we think about that, um, there's a huge opportunity where, when we said we're gonna get to one gigawatt of solar by 2025 and we're the number two installed solar um, in, the, in the US right now, but only 4% of our roofs are covered by solar today. So that is an amazing opportunity to scale that out. And how do we think about community solar? How do we think about, so it's, it's this big challenge of, okay, here's the opportunity, can we move fast enough? And can we align all these partnerships and stakeholder relationships fast enough to be able to deliver on what we think is, to your point on, the opportunity is great, but how do we really execute on that and do the right investments in the right timing? It can be daunting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's similar themes. We're, we're all going really fast in a constantly evolving space, and I think making sure that we're being thoughtful about that along the way, that we're doing things that are credible um, is really important and challenging. And then I think, for us, we're a very large, complex organization that's global. <laughs> And so, you know, we're navigating a variety of different stakeholders, a variety of different regulator expectations and voluntary expectations, and kind of weaving that all in and distilling it down into this comprehensive transition plan, you know, while we're still rolling out targets and, and implementing the people internally to deliver on this. I mean, the knowledge and capacity you know, that is ser seriously lacking. Um, I think just across the industry, it's not unique to Bank of America by any means, but really building people who can run with, you know, these strategies as we're developing and deliver on them, I think is very challenging. I was, I mean, I'm glad you brought up the, the people skills, because for us, I mean, we're constantly hiring. We're constantly looking. And you know, we've decided that, well, we're going to train because it's really hard to find the folks who know about, you know, scope 15. So there's a lot of internal training that you have to do to be able to, to get and get things done. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's my, maybe it's for you. It's the favorite part of my job, honestly, because it's not a one-way thing. I think the more we have people embedded in these different groups, I'm not an accountant. But I play when I'm on TV. But, um, <laughs> but, it is, but it is nice to have that accounting deep expertise that then we kind of combine, we're that joint learning and same thing, like I, I'm not lead certified, but we've got tons of people who are you know, lead certified. So I think as we are bringing more experts to the table in these different functions, it drives that integration, it makes it more core part of the business, it's more valued across the business. And I think that's just, that's what gets me excited, I think about where we are right now and how that's moving. It's a long, we, we need more talent and so, our, Students here, we're excited for you. Um, but I, I think that's what get, makes me excited because I'm seeing that change quicker than it has in the past. So we just have a couple, couple more minutes. So I, I want to keep going on Suzanne's. What, what gives you hope? This, I worked on climate change for a long time, and it can be a little bit daunting and sometimes a little depressing. But I think working with companies like you guys gives me hope. I love seeing all this action. I love seeing people move forward. What, what is motivating for you guys? What gives you hope? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's a little bit different angle on the talent question. Um, investment into new products, new innovation, new business models. In, in last year, 2022, <laughs> we were lead investor um, in a $6 million fundraising effort by Tractor Beverages. Uh, they do the all organic beverages and the bubblers and chipotles across the, the country and a bunch of other outlets. Um, but what is so exciting about investments and partnerships like that as we come to the table, they don't have the history and baggage that you know, we might have internally or the uh, assumptions of what's going to work and what's not going to work. 
And so, you know, they're bringing highly concentrated um, combi blocks, which, uh, you know, they're not shipping water everywhere. It's just the concentrate, and it's aseptically packaged, so it doesn't require refrigeration, so you're avoiding the emissions there. So, I mean, there were just so many things that got our juices flowing, literally, on, um, that was you know, I, I know, I didn't even mean to do that. <laughs> Uh, that was uh, just really exciting. So, you know, not hiring, but bringing new talent, new thinking to the table in ways that also feeds growth for the company, which is just a win-win. This is not a boring topic. Beth? Oh, goodness. Uh, so many things. I mean, I think even being here today gives me hope. I mean, I touched on even what I'm seeing in my own organization, which is um, exciting to see. but. Um, I think in particular, as I've been learning more about the various sectors and understanding how they're connected, and you know, a lot of the solutions that we were hearing about this, this morning, and hearing more about how they're coming to, to fruition, and I guess the other side that I have not talked about at all today <laughs> is our financing activities. So you know, we continue to set targets. We have a trillion dollar target by 2030 specific to environmental transition. And so seeing kind of how the work that I'm doing to do mitigation coming together with the financing for these climate solutions and this actual transition is, is I think, what's giving me hope, the combination of those two. It, it's very fun to see these new solutions. So a new, we are, um, we're a creator of solutions. We, we do carbon offsets. We do renewable energy. We do renewable natural gas. And every time I have somebody new come to me, I'm like, oh, Oh, really? That's a cool thing. Let's, let's look, see if we can figure out how to make that work. Let's see if we can figure out how there might be some incentives. Out. It's, it is very cool to be looking for these new ways of doing things. Well, we're at the end of our time for this panel. So if you would join me in thanking our really great speakers.